Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, security seminar here at Purdue University. Uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Professor Winke Lee from uh, the College of Computing, Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, Professor uh, Lee's research interests include network security, uh, intrusion detection in particular, and network management, distributed data mining, database systems, and workflow modeling and management. Uh, today, uh, Professor Lee will talk about architectural considerations for anomaly detection. Okay, Thank you, Linghui. Um, apologize for delay. So I think uh, security is less a problem than uh, usability. So if anybody can solve this problem, I think we are much better off. So, um, so I guess you know the audience here are very familiar with defense in depth and in general security. So I'm going to just you know fly through the the. The slide here, essentially, I use this slide to tell people that, hey, intrusion, de intrusion detection is important. So, but, but you all know that, so I'm going to skip that. Um, so today, I'm not going to talk about uh, any new algorithms. Um, so so um, I'm going to actually talk about, once you have the anomaly detection algorithms, that you have the individual modules, how to put them back together to have a system that you have, hopefully, a lower false positive rate. So I'm going to talk about, uh, in particular, two um, architectural styles. One is what I call cascade. Another is essentially correlating a bunch of sensors. And I'll give you some examples. So again, I think this can be skipped, uh, and including uh, misuse and anomaly. So all right. So, <clears throat> so the talk starts here. <laughs> so, um, so again, this is somewhat familiar to you guys, uh, I'm sure. And so what are the sort of... Um, key performance uh, metrics if you want to uh, me uh, sort of evaluate how good an IDS is doing. So obviously, <clears throat> the, the most <clears throat> intuitive and most often used uh, is the uh, detection rate, right? And then, the, um, and then uh, some people would like to use false negative rate. Um, and, uh, and also, false alarm rate uh, is also important, right? You, you, you can't ignore false alarm rate because, I mean, if the idea is giving you a lot of false alarms, then people will stop uh, using it. And then, um, and then the, the third one there, uh, Bayesian detection rate, uh, is also very important, but tend to be um, overlooked. Right? So, so that's a, a, a metric that I want to explain more. So how do I remove this? I probably. I'm attempting to do this. Hopefully, it's not going to break. <laughs> but you never know. So. All right, so, um, so the Bayesian detection rate tells you that if an IDS tells you that there's a, um, uh, so if IDS produce a alert, right? So if you're a user of the IDS, so suppose you're a system admin, or you're writing some uh, software that would sort of try to do automatic response. Um, so then you, you, want to, you want to see that when IDS produce a alert, what's the probability that there's actual real intrusion going on? Right, so that's what the Bayesian detection rate would tell you. So I mean, you can you you can express the, uh, it using the uh, Bayesian uh, theorem. Um, so what observation here is that, and of course, if the first arm rate is zero, and then the the Bayesian detection rate would be very good. Um, but on the other hand, but on the other hand, you know. We know that in, in uh, IDS, you know, the, the, uh, typically in algorithm, we have some false positive rate. And, and um, so, so then you have this uh, sort of phenomenon called the base rate fallacy. So essentially, typically, the, uh, typically what we call the, uh, the base rate here, meaning the prior probability that you have some intrusion in, your, in the data that you are analyzing, let's say in traffic, uh, traffic data or your OS, uh, all the data. This probability that you will see some intrusion there actually is very low. You say, you say that's not true because you know, we hear that intrusions are happening all the time. I'm talking about with respect to the, the, the total amount of data that you are analyzing. Suppose you're look, looking at the network traffic. right? So in a day, you, you will see probably millions or tens of millions of packets. How many of those packets are actually associated with some intrusion? Very, very few. Right? Maybe a couple thousand. right? So, so this rate is very, very low. So if you plug in uh, uh, these parameters to the, uh, to the formula, the point is that even if you have a perfect detection rate, 
uh, even if the the the, the first part, first alarm rate is very low. So so here a uh, numerical example is that you have a perfect de uh, detection rate and the first alarm rate is low enough, right? But then and then the, the base rate is also very low, and this is not. Uh, I mean, this is quite real, right? In a, in a normal um, daily traffic, and then um, then the Bayesian detection rate is only 66 percent, meaning one third of the time, the alert from the IDS doesn't tell you anything, right? So it doesn't tell you there's an intrusion. So that's a problem. So I mean, I mean, so 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 uh, this is more from a usability point of view, right? So IDS produce some some um, information, and then you, th you, th you think about you know. How you know how those information is being used for you to manage uh, the the system? So, 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 um, so we we can easily plot a, a few plots here to show that essentially, if the base rate is very low, then it doesn't matter how you improve the the false positive. Suppose the base rate here is very very low, so this blue line here, and then even if you improve the uh, false positive, meaning the false positive rate is close to zero, your Bayesian detection, detection rate is still very very low. Okay, I mean you would you would want to have a uh, higher base rate so that when you reduce the false positive rate, it actually matters. Okay, so the point is that you know if the the base rate is so low, then it doesn't matter what you do. You can try try all your best. You know, you know, spend all your PhD <laughs> years to work on a better algorithm. Okay, you say hey, my my false alarm rate is like you know five percent better. Doesn't matter. I mean, you know, so so that that may not be fair to you, but 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 that's actually the reality. If you want to use the algorithm in in the real world, so the implication to the to the IDS um, research and development uh, essentially is that you know, right now what we have is that we have too many false alarms in the busy network, and it's it's very typical to see you know thousands of false alarms uh, every day. So there's a huge business there out there called alert correlation, and a lot of um, Companies they provide the so-called managed security services to to, to other other customer uh, other companies because these other companies they just can't deal with all the outputs. Okay, so so you can start business by okay I can look at your alarm data and tell you what are the real, what are the real thing. So you think well it, it wouldn't be wouldn't it be better if the ideas you know doesn't produce so much junk right? Uh, so of, of course you can say you can always design a algorithm to reduce false alarm. Say if to, to zero then you know then the the Bayesian Detection rate would be one, but but I think for um, for all of you who know about IDS, you know that's a very difficult uh, task. So so the so this talk is about okay. Suppose we know about the limit about the algorithm and about the, the environment that the IDS has to operate on. Meaning the base rate is very low. What can you do? Can you think about from the architecture point of view? Can you do something about? Uh, uh, this particular problem. So we think that you know, in some cases, um, uh, you know, this is probably doable. But 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 again, this is not like a complete um, work. So so the first uh, architectural uh, style that you can consider is what we call uh, the cascade model. So in a cascade, essentially you have the data uh, at the bottom, and then you uh, the data will go through a stage, uh, a, a series of um, analysis. So at each stage. Um, the analysis module will throw out data, okay, and then whatever is remaining will be passed to the next stage. So essentially, what's being thrown out uh, would be "quote unquote" normal, or in, in, in this context, may not be the pure sort of uh, uh, may not be the absolute normal sense in terms of uh, uh, security goal. It could could just be that you're looking at a particular kind of um, intrusion or anomaly. And the data that you throw out had nothing to do with that kind of intrusion. Now it may have something to do with some other kind, but but you don't care, okay? So so when you throw out throw out the uh, the, the normal, uh, then the point is that hopefully you know at the lower layer, you can throw out a lot of data that that that's not interesting. And then by the time they get to like very high uh, high level module where you have to make a decision. Uh, you want to probably apply some uh, sophisticated analysis, and and the uh, the algorithm you know would likely have some false alarm, but then maybe you know hopefully at that point the data stream has been reduced so much that the base rate is high enough, because at each layer you you are essentially filtering out data that would not be 
interesting. You're keeping the data that will be likely can, uh, uh, contribute to, to the intrusion that you are analyzing. So by the time they get to a higher layer, the base rate is high enough. The point is that then you're giving a chance for your algorithm to actually work. Okay, so that's the main motivation. So there, uh, you, you, you know, uh, there's some uh, nice property, uh, properties about the um, cascade. So for example, um, we can claim that if you look at a cascade, right, the, then the, uh, the Bayesian, the, the Bayesian detection rate of the current module essentially is the base rate of the data to the, to the next higher module. And uh, to, to see this, you know, can easily prove this, right? So because you can rewrite the, the Bayesian, uh, uh, so, so, so you can rewrite the Bayesian detection rate as the probability of that, of a data is being both produced by IDS as a um, alert and also intrusion divided by the probability that this data is also uh, produced by IDS as alert data, right? So the point is that data stream to the next module essentially consists of all the alarms, all the so-called alarm data that are produced by the current module. But you know, within, within that data stream, only some of, some of those are the real intrusions. So if you think, think about that, that way, then, then it's very obvious that, so, 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 so but, 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 but this is exactly how you compute the base rate, right? You, you receive some, some data, and only some portion of it is actual, actual intrusion. So, um, so then you can see that the, the base rate, uh, the, the Bayesian detection of the current module will essentially the base rate of the next module. So that's claim one. And then, and then this is also obvious. So what we're saying here is that your Bayesian detection rate should be greater than the base rate. And, provide, and, and, and if and only if that your, uh, your um, detection rate is greater than false positive rate. And, and you can argue that any reasonable, any allowable IDS would have this property here. Because if you think about it, if you do a random guess, you have like exactly the same, you know, meaning uh, detection rate and false alarm rate would be, equal, would be exactly the same, 0.5. So any reasonable IDS would do better, meaning the detection rate would be greater than the false alarm rate. And we can show that if this is true, then you have this condition, okay? Uh, then you have that property. So just combining these two results, then you, you, can, uh, you can show that the base rate actually would increase from one layer to the next. Just, just you know, plug in the claim one and lemma one. So, so that's a nice property. So, so, so meaning that in a cascade, you can build a cascade so that the, the base rate keeps improving. Now, so that's one, one aspect of it. But of course, you know, if you have, you have to look at some other um, metric, right? So, so the point is that, you know, so if, it's very obvious that if you assume independent features and algorithms, then the, uh, the overall force alarm rate will actually uh, uh, would not increase. And same thing for the, for the uh, true, positive, true uh, positive rate. So, so this actually is good news, right? Because the false positive rate would not go up. But again, the bad news is that the detection rate would likely to, to maintain the same or actually uh, uh, go down. So, so that's, um, that's the bad news. So, so when you design a um, cascade, so some considerations are, are, are that you want to filter out the normal as early as possible, right? And then essentially, you have to think about how do you break the detection process into phases, where each phase try to filter out some data. And, and this is, uh, this normally depends on the, dom the knowledge, I mean, domain knowledge of the application and the, the, the kind of intrusion that you are looking at. And also, you want the module to have very, very high true, pos true positive rate. Because the, the overall true positive rate will be, the, will be the product of all the modules, right? So if you start with something new, uh, something low, then, then the overall rate will also be low. So uh, essentially, you, you, you know, the point is that you want to specialize the, the algorithm for, um, for each, each step. The, the point here is that, so you're asking, how, are you, how, how will you be able to actually, let's say at the lowest layer of your cascade, how will you be able to come up with a, with a module that has very high, uh, very, very high detection rate about the possible intrusions and then uh, low enough false positive rate? Uh, because I mean, isn't that the same goal that you want to accomplish? Meaning, for the overall IDS, you want you want have you want it to to have high uh, 
detectionary and low false positive rate. So you say, you know, so, so how, how will you be able to actually say that, you know, when you start up, the first module will be able to do all the work or accomplish that particular goal? So, so think about, think about my, the argument that you want to filter out normal, right, as early as possible. But how do I know what normal looks like? I mean, that's the problem you want to solve, right? So, I mean, isn't that chicken and egg problem? Yes, in, in general sense. But if you're looking at a specific kind of anomalies, suppose you say, I want to use this architecture style to come up with a, with a system to detect fast scanning worm. So you know certain properties of fast scanning worm. So meaning you, you actually look at a subspace of the, uh, of the um, intrusions. So, so under, under this kind of constraint, you can actually come up with some uh, algorithm that would actually be able to figure out normal very early. Normal here means that something that you are not in interested in. OK, you can do that. So, so what I'm, what I'm, what I'm uh, um, advocating here is that it's very difficult to design a anomaly um, IDS to actually cover the whole attack space. You might, you might as well just divide, divide and conquer. Essentially, you say, okay, here's some space. I know the properties. I can build a cascade, specialize it, and have very high uh, uh, detection rate and, and, uh, and, uh, and all that. So, so here's give you one example. So we use a cascade to actually come up with this system to detect uh, fast scanning worm in your local network, right? So the first phase, essentially, we say, OK, when we, we want to, so the intuition is that if you look at what are properties of worm, right? So obviously, first of all, the worm has to infect some host. And then it would, after the host being infected, it would go out and then scan some other, some other, some other host. So you can think about this as a, 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 a two stages, right? So, so that's why at the first stage, we look for infection-like activity. OK, so, mean, uh, so meaning, meaning that you know, you know, a host is being, being hit at one point and then, and then go out and, and, then go out and, and uh, have some outgoing traffic from the same port. And of course, that's not, not enough, right? So, you, so then the next phase is that for, for those hosts, then you look at, look at its scanning activity to see whether it's scanning in an abnormal rate, OK? And then we say, OK, then, then if you can identify identify a host where it has this infection-like behavior, meaning it's, it's being uh, set, uh, receiving traffic in, at one port and then sending traffic uh, on the same port. And also, its scanning is very, um, uh, uh, scanning rate is very high. Then we know it's a, it's a victim of the worm. Now, this is not new or not you know, uh, surprising. What's surprising here is how we structure the module. We purposely break break this into two phases, where the first phase actually can figure out a lot of data. Whereas a lot of ideas just put, put, this, put, put these two tracks in the same, same rule and just apply, it just, it just analyze all the data. So, um, so that's, that's the um, difference here. And, and we can argue that you know, this would actually produce more efficient and, and uh, accurate um, ideas. So the, the detail of the, um, the algorithm probably is not as important. Um, for example, you know, to, to actually detect uh, infection-like behavior, it's actually it's easy, right? You just keep two, two bloom filters, and you actually check uh, uh, in the timeline you know, what, what are the sort of uh, the host being, uh, ports are being um, visited at the previous time window, and then whether the same ports and same hosts are, are sending out traffic at the same time uh, in the next time period. That's easy. And then for the, um, for the, un for the, for the uh, anom anomaly scanning Detection obviously you need to be a build profile to say normally how much how much scanning uh, uh, what's the normal scanning rate right so essentially we use this uh, uh, chapter uh, inequality to say that you know um, so here the t is the, the threshold and 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 the, essentially say that what's the probability probability that you have some observed instance let's say the scanning rate that's that's very different from um, from the mean, right? So it's, it's bounded by by the uh, by, by this property. So 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 meaning that we only use this to make sure that in a normal operation, the scanning rate is kind of very regular. They don't have big uh, big spikes. They tend to be you know uh, within a very tight range. And if if the scanning rate has this property in the normal operations, then it will be very easy to de to detect any big spike. 
So we use this to check whether we can apply very simple heuristic. So, so the result is that you know, we, we apply it to our network. And uh, so we actually measured for the first phase. If you only use the first phase as the detection module, of course, we can catch all the possible uh, 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 worm data. But also, it has a, also has a false positive rate. Because, I mean, you do have some infection-like uh, uh, activity in the network. And then the data reduction rate is actually quite, uh, quite large. They are meaning only 10% of data would actually be able to pass that particular check. OK, so once you pass the first phase, you're only dealing with 10% of the original data. And then the, the second phase, uh, the first arm rate uh, by itself actually is also quite high. Because, I mean, there's some, some host that will actually, you know, uh, sometimes uh, you know, have, have some spy and, and scanning out, for example, uh, some of the uh, P2P kind of traffic. And then, um, but then when you combine, it turns out that we, we were able to reduce the false alarm rate to be zero within our experiment. I'm not claiming that that's, that's the general uh, finding. Uh, and, and, and that's because they don't have overlap, meaning the false positive you have in the first phase, they don't overlap with the, with the second phase. Okay, which is nice. And uh, some results, um, we actually test this in, in some large data set, and it turns out that, you know, there are not many infection like uh, behavior or and 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 it it, it uh, if if some kind of some kind of service like let's say port 80 has infection like behavior then the scanning rate tends to be very very low and also the variance is very is zero meaning they are they are, you know if you look at the time window of 1 second they always you know stay very tight bound uh, they don't have like big spikes and all that so uh, so the drug attack traffic very similar um, uh, Results we've got, but now some. So you say, okay, you're not convinced because I mean I can easily come up with some scenario to defeat uh, your detection algorithm. All true, okay. So for example, you say, what about you know I have some uh, PDP traffic, which which can look like worm, because you, you do have some server that get contacted and then send out to other uh, server right to, to query. So so this wouldn't this look like look like worm? Yes, it will. But you know, using a cascade, you can easily add another module at, at the top, which would be, would be more sophisticated. For example, you can look at, look at the size of the connection. Let's say P2P connection, I would, I would guess that the payload tends to have a much bigger payload size, because you're transferring files and, and music and everything, right? And also, you can probably do some payload analysis. That would, yeah, that, that, that would be another sort of more sophisticated kind of analysis. The point is that you want to add the sophisticated analysis modules at the top of a cascade, where you have to figure out a lot of uninteresting traffic, okay, where you are dealing, dealing with very likely intrusive-like traffic, okay. So if you do this, then you have much, much, much better chance, okay. So, so that's the argument. Um, all right. So, so that so uh, just want to point out that you know, obviously, layer kind of architecture is not new, right. So, for example, Bro, which is a uh, uh, even a, a signature-based idea actually has some notion of doing layering. So essentially, you have network traffic, and, and then you, you filter a bunch of traffic that, that doesn't con concern the, 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 the network security policy. And then, and then the, the package stream will be summarized into what we call event data, which is much higher level semantics, and the, the size also much smaller. And then you, you actually apply policy script. So you can see the, the, the volume of the stream actually gets Reduce at each layer, and the idea is logic actually in, in, in the, is in the policy. So, so, uh, so I, I wanted to say that you know ideas like snort is 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 doomed to fail because it analyzes intrusion at each per packet, and you have hu some such huge amount of data. So I mean, so that's why if you have any experience running snort, you have a ton of false positive. Why? Because it's doing intrusion analysis here instead at the higher layer. Okay, so so that's uh, so we're working on some theoretical uh, analysis on how they formally analyze uh, different ar uh, architectures, uh, and then uh, how do you sort of argue one is better than the others? So that will be uh, ongoing work. So another uh, archite architecture style to reduce uh, false alarm, which is also somewhat obvious, is that you can you can attempt to deploy a lot of sensors in your network. Suppose they look at different uh, segments of a network, or looking at different kind of um, evidence. And then you try to correlate them. And when you correlate, 
you can actually reduce, uh, you have a chance to re reduce uh, false positive. So, so, so again, you can think about uh, all these uh, diverse sensors and correlation as kind of a layer architecture, meaning that the sensor already filtered out data that, that is not interesting. The sensor only sends reports to the correlation engine. Right? So the report you can think about as, as very, um, very much a interesting event data that would likely to, to actually uh, would likely be related to the real intrusion, right? So, uh, so, so then, of course, then the uh, research question is that what event do you monitor? But that's what the IDS people are worrying. And then, uh, and then the, the, cor the correlation engine will actually analyze the event data from the sensors and then uh, make, make, se make a sense uh, of whether there's actually intrusion or not. So, so the argument is that the event data would already have a very high base rate. And, uh, and the question we want to answer is that how, do, you know, how many sensors? For example, I mean, there are many questions here, right? But one particular question that we are we were looking into is that how many sensors observation are sufficient for you to actually uh, have very confident uh, output to say this is a, a intuition, right? So, so the the so example of of, of such sort of a sensor and then correlation, uh, so kind of two layer system is is the Honeystat system that we built. Essentially, that's another. Um, so we 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 were, we were working on on worms last year like everybody else. So that's why I use those examples. I, I don't necessarily say. These, you know, the worm research is great, but just I think it's very intuitive. Everybody understands worms, and uh, so anyway, so we work on Honeystat, and the idea is that you know, uh, the general idea is that you know we can use some VMware right, uh, uh, to do honey pods, and then essentially, the the one thing about worm is that it would normally blindly scan a lot of lot of holes. So if you have a whole farm of honey pods, then it's likely that you will see some. Some you know uh, you will see the same strange behavior across more than one honeypot. Okay, so, so that's the idea. So you, you deploy a bunch of honeypots. You know you you know I mean I think hardware actually is very cheap. What's, what's expensive is the IPs. How do you get a large uh, large segment of um, IPs from from your uh, IT group here? And 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 we were lucky to, to get that. So so then um, so then the 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 research. Question here is how do you correlate the alarms from the honey pots so that you know this is a, a worm versus somebody just scanning or somebody just randomly poke at your honey net. Okay? So that's the intuition. And that's system details. Uh, so, so essentially we have a, we have two 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 phases again. So one phase is the black box, meaning meaning each honey pot would actually um, try to figure out. Uh, some incoming traffic and reports interesting activity. For example, they would say, "Okay, my honeypot is uh, uh, is um, uh, is sending out is sending outgoing traffic." Now that's very strange, strange uh, activity. So when, whenever you have honeypot sending out outgoing traffic, you know this is something that you want to log into. Okay, and then uh, so so essentially the correlation phase would, would actually attempt to explain for each honeypot. What triggers the outgoing traffic? Suppose, suppose for honeypot A, you say, okay, the outgo outgoing traffic is triggered by the incoming traffic to this particular port. You say, okay, that's an interesting pattern. But now, if you see the same pattern on more than, you know, let's say more than, let's say five honeypots, then you know, okay, well, that's strange. I mean, that must be an automatic program running there. Because, I mean, all these honeypots, they're not necessarily related. Right? They're just in the same. Address uh, 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 segment that you have, the uh, IP segment. So why would they have the same exact same pattern uh, across multiple honey pots? So that must be an automatic program, which which means they could likely uh, to be a worm, right? So the kind of in interesting events that we actually uh, gather, uh, 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 we we uh, we um, um, we use some you know domain knowledge to analyze you know what a worm would likely do. Right? For example, it would come in, explore, and then go out and and get some. Uh, Get some uh, uh, they call it egg, meaning the, the attack programs and and so on and so forth. So there are multiple uh, points here that you can actually uh, uh, use to, to 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 detect some interesting activities. For example, you know you, you probably get, you can detect buffer overflow, some algo network activity, or also if the attack program is being stored at the hard drive, then you will see some uh, possible disk activity. Okay, so essentially, all these are interesting activities that the honeypot can actually uh, 
capture. OK, so, so meaning memory events, disk events, and network events. All right. Now, these events by itself, they in indicate some intrusion. Obviously, by definition, you know, nobody should be do anything on the honey pot. So anything there is, is bad. But again, you know, we are only interested in a particular problem, meaning, meaning the world. Right? So, so, so the point is that there are a lot of, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, event data actually doesn't contribute to the analysis of worm, right? So only, the, only some of those would be, um, would be uh, useful. But again, you know, the argument here is that because we're looking at the alerts from honeypot, this already has very, very high base rate. We're, looking, we're not looking at the raw traffic to your network. Right? The raw, raw traffic network may not have some, some, uh, some um, attack traffic. But the, but the events that we capture in a honeypot, they are very good candidates. Right? So, so again, you know, the argument is that when you look at the event data from the honeypot, the base rate is very high. So you have a much better chance of finding out whether there's a worm or not. So, so, the, um, so, uh, so, so, so essentially, how do we um, correlate a, um, a uh, honeypot event with, with, with some other activity on a honeypot? So, Suppose here at, at this particular time uh, we, we see the outgoing traffic. So we want to correlate activities uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, preceding, preceding time windows that can explain the current activity. So, so again, you know, we are not using any hard-coded uh, uh, rules to do, to, do this, to do this. We attempt to do it automatically. So I'm going to get into uh, the details of the analysis. But, but the point is that the intuition here is that the more recent events on honeypot will probably explain more about the current outgoing activity. So that's the uh, intuition. So we can sort of, um, we can use, then use some uh, logistic analysis to actually explain, try to uh, attempt to explain and, and figure out whether we can actually analyze and, and uh, conclude that, you know, for example, this activity at port C actually triggered the outgoing traffic, for example. And if the same patterns uh, are discovered across multiple honeypots, then we think, okay, that could be um, could be a worm. So essentially, you know, this shows that you know many observations across multiple honeypots actually combine to um, to make the um, detection, right? So so um, so so essentially, the one one insight here is that suppose you have some inconsistent patterns. Suppose you see outgoing traffic across multiple honeypots, but then the patterns are not consistent across Multiple, multiple honeypots. <clears throat> then it's likely that it may not be caused by, by automatic program. It could just caused by some random hackers, right? But, but then, of course, the question is that what about if I write a very smart worm to, to do this? Yes, that's possible. Um, uh, we, we're going to work on, work on that. But, but, but the thing is that uh, for all the, all the smartness of, about worm, there's arguments saying that, you know, how do you encode that kind of that kind of uh, uh, smart logic in, um, into the body of worm. Think about think about if a, if a worm writer. Of course, you can do a lot lot of a uh, lot of a uh, uh, lot of things. But then you also want to keep the worm body to be to be relatively small. So so if you encode a lot of logic, then your worm payload would likely to be actually very big. For example, there's a famous study on routable worm, meaning that suppose I don't have scanner worm, I know exactly which address is routable. It turns out that to encode that knowledge requires a huge amount of space, right? So obviously, each worm, worm, each worm payload has to carry that knowledge around. But if, if that, if, if, if in order to carry the knowledge around, the cost is too, too high, then the worm writer may not, may not do that. So that's why the worm tends to be stupid, because they want to, they want to spread very fast, very, very lightweight, right? So, so I mean, there's also a trade-off there, in, in, meaning you know, how, how small you, you can be uh, 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 be, be, being, a, being a woman and how easy it is for the ideas to, to catch you. So, anyway, so let's talk about the correlation analysis. So essentially, we are we are uh, we are interested in this problem where the honeypot is awake or not. Suppose you know, suppose you say, you know, we use the variable y to represent uh, whether a honeypot uh, is sending out going traffic or not, meaning awake or or sleep, right? So then we say, you know, uh, awake is one, otherwise it's zero. Then we want to say that whenever the honeypot wakes up and sends out outgoing traffic, 
what are the contributing, uh, uh, what are the activities that contribute contribute to that kind of uh, algorithm connection, and then how you know sort of a, that's a, so the x would be representing the uh, the uh, contributing activities, and then beta would be you know how how much how much contribution each activity actually would give to to this uh, outgoing traffic. So so we use logic analysis essentially because it's a bi binary um, variable, and essentially try to so using logic analysis essentially try to find out um, uh, you know how likely you know uh, uh, the uh, the axis meaning the um, activities happening at the honeypot contribute to the fact that the honeypot now sends out outgoing traffic. Okay, so, so this is standard uh, uh, techniques. And um, so, so the way that we, the, that we uh, apply this is that the x here essentially is the inverse distance in time. Suppose, suppose I see a um, outgoing traffic, okay? And so let's say I see outgoing traffic at this particular time. Then I look back, look back, let's say within, let's say two days. Okay, and then there will be a lot of activities. Let's say there's activity at port I. Then, uh, then the, then the distance, in, uh, uh, distance in time from this outgoing traffic versus activity at, uh, at, at, at port I would be dt, right? So one over dt would be the x value. So essentially we're trying to explain whether the incoming traffic or some event of, at port I would actually explain the outgoing traffic at this particular time. So, so then we lo just apply logic analysis to, to compute uh, the statistics, for example, the, the beta values. So that will tell you whether the traffic, I mean, the, the event at port I actually contributes to, 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 the, to this outgoing traffic. So, and, and uh, we actually, after we published paper, we, you know, I find out, okay, there was, uh, this, this was actually um, an oversight in terms of how we do this. So ideally, what we should be doing is that we should have two-level correlation. The first level correlation is that for each honeypot, you correlate the outgoing event with the, with the, with the other events at the honeypot. And then the next level correlation will be you sort of correlate across multiple honeypots to see, the, to see whether the same patterns actually, actually um, uh, is there. But then um, my kind of oversight, my student actually, actually did the following. He, he, he essentially got all the events across all the honeypots together. And then try to try to use that in logic analysis. So so this would be, for example, this would be the uh, ob observing outgoing traffic at one honeypot, and then from there he would gather all events from all other honeypots. That would be all the xij here, and then do correlation. Uh, so so he argued that this would work, but but there could be some there could be some um, some um, false positive, meaning that suppose you may be able to to actually um, uh, correlate a particular uh, attack here with some outgoing traffic here, right? So what you want is that you correlate here and then cor uh, cor correlate across multiple honeypots. So we have we have some workaround. Essentially, we want to filter out filter out um, um, honeypots that have no uh, 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 no no um, activities. So. So anyway, so so that's kind of limitation that that I mean at, at this point doesn't doesn't cause a lot of problems, but but it's not not quite right. But anyway, uh, the the main uh, the, the sort of the more interesting problem here is that so we say that you 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 deploy honeypots right, and then you observe the uh, activities, and then you say okay, if the same patterns happen, then you know there's a um, there's a worm. The, now the question is how do you know how many how many observations do you need? Okay, so that's a uh, that's a question that, that we, we think is important um, because because at the end we want to reduce the false positive. But think about think about uh, in this particular problem, for honeypot to actually be uh, for a uh, uh, false alarm to actually show up, the same inconsist uh, same pattern, same false pattern should have to be consistently show up across multiple honeypots, and that's very unlikely. Suppose you say that you see outgoing traffic and you say okay it's it's triggered by this incoming activity at port C. Suppose Suppose this is a false, false, uh, false positive, but 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 if you see the same false positive across multiple honeypots, that itself is very strange. It's very unlikely that is a real false positive. Okay, and, and uh, but but again, you know, how do you find the sample size? 
Um, there's some uh, some work in the in, in statistics which 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 is not which is not um, how to put it. They they don't have any principal way of telling you what is the correct sample size, and there's only they only have rule of thumb. So rule of thumb is so called rule of ten. Okay, I'm going to actually um, skip a little bit uh, details because of, because of time. So so the, the the reason that we want to deal with sample size also is that we want to make sure that. You know, you have enough high enough confidence that you can reject a null no, um, hypothesis. Meaning, meaning when you say this particular uh, particular event x one, right? Meaning port, you know, uh, activity at port one contributed to outgoing traffic. Uh, it's actually, it's actually, uh, 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 it's it's actually um, valid, right? So, so that's the beta one value that we we'll compute. So, so the um, um, probably want to skip that. Okay, so so the 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 the, the rule of ten, um, the rule of ten, is essentially says that you know suppose you have a lot of observations, right? And and these are rare, rare uh, um, activities. Suppose you want to explain those rare activities. So this rule of thumb meaning that you want to have for each parameter you want to have at least ten observations for the least frequent uh, value. So so um, this would be too abstract, but, but let's, let's use an example here, right? Suppose I have 50 observations of acquired honeypots, meaning y equal to 0, meaning that the honeypot doesn't send out any traffic, OK? And then there are 30 honeypot, uh, 30 observations, uh, 30 active, uh, uh, active observations, meaning there are 30 observations where the honeypot sends out traffic. And then, then the, the essentially, then, then the, the model should have at least uh, ha, uh, should have at least um, three parameters. So, so meaning, meaning, so, so you can have more than three parameters, uh, meaning port activities. Suppose you only have three ports that contribute to the outgoing traffic, then there's a chance that you can explain. Okay, yeah, but um, otherwise, if you have, if you have a traffic to many many ports, then then you can explain which port actually contribute to the outgoing traffic. That's the intuition. All right, so. The testing, you know, we did it very well. You know, again, only limited testing had no positive. So really work. CMU doing something similar, but they're not doing any logic analysis. But the idea is very similar. Okay, analyzing activities across multiple file systems. Anyway, to conclude, uh, you know, I think the I think we need to consider uh, architecture uh, architecture of the anomaly idea so that the Bayesian detection is high enough. So that you you know, so the point is that then you have uh, small enough. Uh, rate of false positive, and then the two two architecture will be cascade or correlation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have time for questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker. We'll be walking back to.